I would like to welcome everybody, and in, per in particular, our special guest speaker, Professor Ilaria Capua, and the president uh, of uh, Bocconi, Mario, Professor Mario Monti. Thank you for coming. Professor Capua is a preeminent professor and director of the One Health Center of Excellence for Research and Training at the University of Florida. We can proudly say that Professor Capua is also a close friend of Bocconi, being a member of the university's International Advisory Council. Today, her talk will focus on the holistic concept of One Health, which recognizes that the health of human beings, animals, plants, and environments are interconnected and interdependent. Professor Capua will also explain why today, mainly by virtue of the data revolution, we are finally able to implement multidisciplinary approaches to complex issues. This is true for the natural sciences like biology, as well as the social sciences uh, as uh, economics. Therefore, besides the fascinating concept of uh, One Health, we will learn a lot about big data as an enabler of a totally different approach, not only to scientific research itself, but also to collaborative work and problem solving at large. I think that uh, you all know very well the impressive CV of Ilaria Capua. Uh, you probably know that uh, um, she has been uh, a game changer uh, in science um, to open source strategy. In fact, back in 2006, she was a pioneer in sharing the genetic sequence of the H5N1 virus that we know as uh, uh, avian um, uh, flu uh, virus. And uh, here you can see how the New York Times uh, uh, sp spoke about this uh, issue. At a time when health authorities are racing to head off uh, a possible avian flu pandemic, it is distressing to learn that the World Health Organization is operating a secret database that holds the virus uh, genetic information. A lone Italian scientist has challenged the system by refusing to send her own data to the password protected archive. Instead, she released the information publicly and urged her colleagues to do the same. She is surely right. The possibility of breakthroughs can increase only if many more scientists can analyze the data. Well, Professor Capua challenged the system because she knew it was the right thing to do for the benefit of science. She was incredibly brave, passionate, and wise. But basically, she knew. When still many people didn't know or turned their heads away, she knew the world had changed. And the age of knowledge sharing was here to stay. And now I would like to, um, to tell you something about my personal discovery of her. I've known uh, about her job uh, as a scientist uh, and her experience as a politician. But uh, when I read her book, uh, I cre cre clearly realized that she's not only a great scientist, but an, an extraordinary person that has been able to react against terrible fake news and to sort it out with courage, strength, intelligence. Then I had the opportunity to meet and chat with her here at Bocconi, and I'm very proud to introduce such a special woman today. Before uh, leaving the floor to Ilaria, let me remind you the rules of the game, this seminar belong to the Broaden Your Frame uh, seminar series and uh, is a part, a 
of the curricular supplementary activities that you have in your study plan. And uh, during the current academic year, we have offered seven seminars during the first semester, and uh, we will offer eight seminars in the second semester. And uh, uh, these uh, curricular supplementary activities will be deemed past for anyone who attends a total of six seminars and send to this uh, um, uh, internet, uh, um, to the, uh, this address, a triple tweet up to 840 characters. The triple tweet has to be a free form reflection. Don't send, please, a synthesis of the, uh, the speech, just your thoughts and your reflection on the topic. And now, Ilaria, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you to Dean Caru, Car, Caru, who I am trying to, I'm chasing actually, because I want to hug her because I never got such a wonderful introduction. So thank you, thank you. It's women who change the world. Don't ever forget this. Grazie. So thank you and good morning. It is a real pleasure to be here and it's really nice to have a full room and lots of smiley eyes looking at me. Okay, now you can close your laptops because you're not going to surf on the web while I'm talking. You're going to listen because this is about you, it's not about me. I'm done. I'm too old. Um, it's your world, not mine. I can try and give you a little bit of advice, but you know, there's only so much you can do. Um, I also want to be in those tweets. There's my Twitter account and um, I want you to talk about this. So, um, what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about a revolution which is a necessary revolution. And um, I am um, going to um, take you with me through time. And so, that's why you need to close your laptops because you're gonna ride with me. Are you ready? So fasten your seat belts, we're gonna ride. I put up this first picture because at times um, things might not be as they appear and um, we have made many mistakes. Um, we know that there have been generations of children that um, because it wasn't very clear that they had eyesight problems, they were taken as children that were not particularly responsive and were not um, capable of learning. And instead, a lot of these children were not dull, but they only needed glasses. And you know what a big difference it can be if you can read properly or not. And so the solution to a dull child was actually getting him a pair of glasses. So anybody know who this guy is? This is not a good start. Nobody? Like nobody in the room knows who this guy is? I realize it's not a very good picture and that you guys only deal with pixels, but... No? Niente. Nessuno. Hippocrate. Ever heard of him? Hippocrates? Hippocrates. Hippocrates was a guy who lived many, many years ago, about 2,500 years ago, but he was quite smart and he is considered the father of medicine. But um, one of the uh, intuitions that Hippocrates had is this. And this is the theory of the humors, because you know, like many, many years ago, 2,500 years ago we're talking about, um, like we didn't know much about anatomy. We didn't know much how things worked and so, um, Hippocrates was the first person who ever thought, but you know what? We are interconnected, so parts of us are interconnected and they work together. Because this is not immediately obvious if you don't know anything about anatomy because you've never opened a dead body. Mm, but also Hippocrates said, wait a minute, it's not only what's happening inside us, it's what's happening around us. And so the climate can influence our health, temperature can influence our health. And you know, 
you might think, yeah, okay, we know this, right? But we know it now. 2,500 years ago, it wasn't that easy or obvious. 2,500 years after Hippocrates, and I will talk to you about what's in between, um, the concept of One Health was developed. And the concept of One Health is really about looking at health as a shared value. And so, our health, my health, your health, your health, your health, is not only linked to what you do, but it is linked to what you eat. It is linked to what you drink, you breathe, and how you take care of yourself. And so, the health of humans is actually um, a very important driver for the health of animals and for the health of the environment. This makes sense, right? Agree? You get it? Hello, back there, you get it? Mm hmm? Hmm. Now, this is where I need your brains. Okay, we're gonna take this concept which is flat, okay? The One Health Venn diagram, Venn diagram is flat. Let's try and put it in three dimensions and look at how the One Health concept has developed and will develop over time because we are looking into the future. We are looking at the health of your children and of your grandchildren, okay? So stand up. We're in three dimensions now. We're going in time because if we look at where we should be pointing in, in year 5000, let's stretch it, is the convergence of health. We don't want to have an unhealthy environment and people to live 250 years, do we? And then children die because they get intoxicated. Um, if we look at the health as a value, we should recognize that health as a value belongs to people, it belongs to animals, it belongs to plants, and it belongs to the environment. And because we are the species in charge, yeah? Do you want to put an earthworm to be in charge of this? Do you want to put a banana tree to be in charge of this? No, right. We are in charge, and so I think we should do something. Why? because more and more people are around and we're gonna have to feed these people. But also, look at this. This is um, life expectancy since 1770. Um, the bottom line is Africa. Um, Africa now overall has a life expectancy between 50 and 60, which is much more than what it was years ago, and it's gonna improve. We have the knowledge, we have the tools, we have everything we need that we need to put in place to bring that number up. And so it'll take time, um, but we'll get there. And so what's the next challenge? That's what, I, that's what you guys should be looking into. Anybody know who this guy is? No, cioè, ragazzi, c'è manco un ciclista in questa stanza. One cyclist. Froome, è eh, Froome, Chris Froome. And so we are all gonna be Chris Froome, time trial, and we're gonna run through time, through the tunnel of time, okay? There he is at the very start with Hippocrates' idea. Makes sense? Makes sense. Look at the circles. Animal health, human health, and environmental health. They are together. Hippocrates had got it. Let's move on. We move to approximately the 15th century, and a Belgian guy called Andrea Vesalio came all the way to Italy, actually to Padova, to completely rewrite human anatomy. Before Vesalio, there was no anatomy. Uh, Vesalio, okay, listen to this, without a refrigerator, huh, wanna talk about it? 
redrew, completely drew, and had also um, some, some um, artists to work with him, redrew human anatomy and learned that human anatomy was different from animal anatomy by doing a comparative study. And so he moved out of his own field to look at what was happening in other species and said, but look, this is different. And so by comparison, he redefined one of the most important pillars of knowledge in science. Nobody had ever done that before. And so around the 15th century, what do we learn? We learn actually that the health of humans and the anatomy of humans and the health of uh, animals, they are very similar because you know what? We do work in a similar way. The environment was a bit too big at that time. It took them another, another 150 years to figure out the germ theory. And basically, they, we were not getting sick because of smelly gases. We were getting sick because there were small microorganisms that could make us sick. But Pasteur discovered that these microorganisms, some of them, came from animals. <gasps> came from animals. So the blessed creature, we are a blessed creature, we are a special creature, actually gets infected with bugs from animals. That was a shocker. And, uh, but Pasteur pro proved it and where was his insight? His insight was in looking beyond what was the knowledge of the time. Around the 18th century, a guy called John Snow um, f why are you laughing? Because you you know him. Ah, you know. Wow. I think they need a round of applause because um, John Snow is the father of epidemiology, so this is actually an improvement for a university that is specialized in other topics. So complimenti, unless you're referring to non è vero? Ah. No, what do you mean another John Snow? About John Snow is an easy name, like Mario Rossi. He knew the right John Snow. Okay, anyway, this guy John Snow, okay, this guy John Snow in London was, a, was an MD and um, in London there was cholera, like in many other places. And actually, they couldn't figure out why, how cholera was spreading, right? Uh, because they were still thinking, but this is the fumes, it's the miasma. And um, John Snow, with a very clever observation, a lot of walking around, identified that there was one pump in Soho, in Soho, that was contaminated because one of the houses nearby the pump had a leak in the sewage system. They had cholera, cholera got in the water and infected the whole of London. And so at the 18th century, we suddenly realize, oh wait, but it's even the environment that we have to think of because the environment even plays a very important role in the epidemiology of diseases. And so around the 18th century, you see that human health and animal and uh, environmental health actually touch each other. And so we're still moving in time, we're running in time, and as we move through the centuries, we realize that perceptions change and as our knowledge increases, we suddenly realize some m miraculous solutions like closing a water pump and saving thousands and thousands of lives. Okay. Our cyclist is still on his way and um, the next thing he's going to bump into is the millennium. The turn of the millennium. In year 2000, around year 2000, we're doing a bit of bundling here of course, we suddenly realize that there is the millennium bug. 
which is this. The millennium bug was an epidemic that um, cost, if I remember correctly, I think about 60 billion to manage, um, simply because of the disruption of um, air traffic and of traveling and um, <clears throat> of international movements. Um, sono in ritardo? Ah. Um, so, yeah, so we suddenly realized, <gasps> but like I can get infected with a virus that comes out of a skunk. You know what a skunk is? And no, qua ci siamo, eh? You know what a skunk? Puzzola. Skunk is puzzola, okay? So out of a civet cat, which is a sort of skunk, in Hong Kong, um, a virus emerged, which was SARS, that got into the airing system of a hotel and infected a series of people that then got on planes and took SARS to Italy, to Canada, to all, all over the world. And, and we had to stop it. But suddenly you say, hey, a virus can get on a plane. Okay, so let's see what else we have that we need to add in the equation since we are now in the new millennium. So we have SARS, we have emerging infections, we have Ebola, we have all these horrible diseases that we can import into our back garden. We have climate change. So climate change is, is the glue between us. Climate change affects from allergy to Zika. All the alphabet is, is, is touched by climate change. And then we have the globalization of, of traffic. Everybody's moving. So these three elements, these three elements are the last step that take us where we need to be. Because we're, we, we are not, I mean, we are not stuck on, hmm, okay, let's look at this. And hmm, yes, maybe we should look at this. No. This is what you guys need to bring to the table. You need to open your mind and you need to look at where those new interconnections are and how we can use them. Because, basically, if you look at the convergence we mentioned before, it is quite clear to see that through the use of big data, that convergence can happen and we can learn how to move forward. Looks quite similar. And it can actually be quite big for those of you who do data science and you know. Great, this is really good. Isn't it? Isn't it good? Così così. And now what? Yeah, it's not easy to say now what. We all agree with you. Yes, of course, we all agree. We're worried about our own little selves, but we're also worried about what we're going to leave to our children and our grandchildren and where are we going. So now what? Now we have to start talking about health in a different way. And we have to understand that health is a value. And health is not a value only to people. It is a value, it is a system of values. And if you have sick plants, that is going to, sick trees, this is going to impact your health and the health of the environment. One health is our wealth. It is how we can continue to exist without destroying while we are advancing. Okay, so I don't have any solutions. I really don't. I have some ideas. I want ideas from you because you guys are younger, smarter, and, and uh, probably much more intelligent as well. So the first thing is learn from mistakes. We have made lots of mistakes over years because we didn't know, right? One of the things which we cannot do anymore is use antibiotics as if they were parmigiano, okay? Basta, this is over. You know why? 
Do I need to explain this to you? You get it. Okay, so we have overused in antibiotics, or in animals. In, I just would like to mention that in some parts of the world, they are spraying trees with antibiotics to control tree diseases. Um, antibiotics go in the water, I think this is quite self-explanatory, and they contaminate the environment, and they generate resistance. Do you know what superbugs are? Superbugs. Superbatteri. Do you know what antimicrobial resistance is all about? Do you know that antimicrobial resistance is probably going to kill more people in 2050 than cancer and cardiovascular diseases put together? No. Well, if you don't know, you better start thinking about it. So, basically, the extensive use of antibiotics has created a population of bacteria that are much more resistant to the use of antibiotics than what they were before. And therefore, um, some infections that you may um, be exposed to, especially if you're in a hospital, might not be curable. Okay? So you get an infection and there's no medicine that will fix that infection. Because we have selected a population of bacteria that are the so-called super bacteria, which I would call super killers, not super bacteria. Okay. This is something else that we cannot do. To control fastidious and invasive species of insects, we kill bees. This is not possible. We can't do it anymore. We have to find ways um, to maintain um, the environment alive. You are aware that if bees disappear, we're gone. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. This cannot happen anymore. Okay. So I'm not going to go into the specifics of what's happening and what has happened over the past few years in Italy with this um, dreadful and, and, and um, horrendous infection of olive trees. But um, in, in Puglia, um, olive trees have been infected with a bacterium which is vector-borne. So it is transmitted by insects. So insects infect the trees and they spread infection to other trees. And the immense cultural and botanical heritage of some parts of Italy is being lost because this um, outbreak was completely mismanaged. But the picture you see below is not Italy, it is Florida. In Florida, in 10 years, the citrus industry has uh, basically collapsed to being 20% of what it was um, yeah, 10 years ago because of a disease of oranges that was not treated and now is all over the place, has killed all the trees and the industry is in absolute despair. Okay, another thing we need to learn how to do is we le need to learn how to communicate certain emergencies better because um, we, we, as scientists, we need to be able to tell our story and to tell it right. And um, we cannot uh, continue to have hypes of attention on the media that then boil down to a nothing because... Um, People want to be informed, they want to be informed properly, and they don't want to be afraid. And so, this is something else, I think, that we can improve on. In the United States, just a couple of months ago, there was a recall of lettuce. There was not one leaf of lettuce in Salada to be found in any American supermarket. Nothing, zero, because there was a contamination in one of the states that is a um, producer of lettuce. The contamination with an E. coli, which 
quite a nasty strain of a bacteria um, got into the circuit and they had to do a recall of all lettuce in the United States. Hmm? Maybe acting before and not after and not allowing messages like this to go out um, could help because people lose trust. They lose trust in institutions, they lose trust in organization, and they lose trust in um, those uh, bodies that are supposed to make them feel safe. Okay, so I said learn from mistakes. I think that this is quite easy. Um, we have to look back and we have to have the guts to say we should rethink this and we should do it better. But also we need to bring in other disciplines because biomedicine has been completely, completely um, uh, impermeable or rather impermeable to other disciplines and we, need, we really need to uh, move beyond. And I'd like to mention a couple of things that we are doing at UF and that we are doing in our center to achieve this result. So, we are using art to talk about science. Um, we um, collaborated with Istituto Italiano di Tecnologia uh, on this exhibition, which was an exhibition of, uh, um, by, of pictures taken by Nobel laureates, and um, they are very, very beautiful. We put them all around campus. We had a campus rally with all our students take a picture with, um, with uh, our piece of art. And in this way, students that were uh, interested in completely different uh, topics um, were able to approach certain techniques that are used in science. And this is the la we it became a traveling show, and this is the last... Um, uh, the, the final destination of the exhibition, which was really, really um, an astonishing success. What else are we doing? So I told you about this disease of oranges. Now, um, okay, what's, what is one of the... Now you're going to start thinking because I'm fed up with talking. So what is one of the solutions to a disease, of, a disease of oranges? It's written up there. It's not that difficult. I think you can do it. He said, GMO, GMO, GMO. So why don't we build a resistant tree that doesn't get this infection? We can engineer it in the lab, okay? But, and, and you know, you can do it. But Arden, would you like to have um, orange juice for breakfast? Would you like to have orange juice produced from genetically modified oranges? No. He said no. I'm not going to comment on this, but he said no. And so are we going to ask the industry to spend millions to develop genetically modified trees that then we're going to plant, it's going to take them 10 years to make any oranges and then nobody wants them in their breakfast. And so we are working with social media and, and with data scientists to analyze the sentiment and to see whether using um, genetically modified trees could be a solution that actually makes sense for the average consumer. Um, we are <clears throat> using pets as sentinels um, for contaminants in the environment to see to use them as a model of exposure for toddlers, for children. So um, many, many products are sprayed on our lawn every, every day. If you have a garden, if you have a lawn, we use herbicides, we use pesticides, and uh, our children mm, are there all the time, and so are our pets. And so we are developing a system to look into pets with non-invasive um, technology that allows us to understand what the exposure is. Okay, this is the last point I'm going to make. Um, so nowadays it is, it is possible to cure dogs for, that are affected by cancer. Um, so, 
you know, generally it's aging uh, people who want to extend the life of their animal and they are very, very bound to that animal and it's really difficult for them to get separated. And so the veterinarian will say, yeah, we can give some chemotherapy to the dog, it'll live another six months. In what conditions is another story. But chemotherapy is immunosuppressive, right? Hmm? You know? Is immunosuppressive, so it reduces your immune res responses. And so guess what they give these dogs all the time? Antibiotics. And so you ha you're keeping alive a sick, half-dead dog. You are using um, drugs which are powerful. And you are selecting in that family a population of bacteria that is going to become more and more resistant. And so grandma, who was, doesn't, want to, doesn't want that dog to go, and will hug that dog, and will be in close contact with, with that dog, or the little nephew or grandchild can get infected with a multi-resistant bug that we selected. Okay, so there are complex decision that need, decisions that need to be taken that are, involve the industry, that involve professions, that involve people, but we have to think. We can't just do it because, yeah, okay, I'm going to get a bit of money out of this old lady and who cares. It doesn't work like that anymore. Okay, this is something else that we are doing. We are... Um, we have developed this fellowship program which is about cr creating One Health Minds. So we want to have um, young professionals or graduate students who are interested in um, exploring areas that go from biomedicine to agriculture with a strong data science component. We are working with this on this with um, a, um, Easy of Torino, Institute for Scientific Interchange of Torino, and um, we are looking for young, uh, motivated, motivated, uh, and bright fellows who want to look at their future in a different way and who want to do something for their future um, because ultimately. Um, it is our responsibility and it is your responsibility. So, um, interdisciplinarity is easy to talk about, is cool because everybody talks about it, but then when you get down to doing it, nobody wants to put money into it. So, it's much harder, but I am 100% confident that a true interdisciplinary preparation can give enormous advantages to new generations. And so this is my um, last slide. Um, you might need glasses. You might not be able to see very well. You might see very well, but there's nothing really worse in life than having sight and no vision and not knowing where you're going to go. Thank you very much, and um, come and see me in Florida. <laughs>
the Italian political situation and vaccines, vaccines, and uh, what is your position on that? Because you talked about um, hypes about uh, certain diseases that then um, don't bring any anything done. So, what do you think about that? And uh, yeah, just uh, curiosity. Thank you. So there's a saying in English: "Curiosity killed the cat." So yeah, so um, yeah, vaccines is a is a hot issue, but I have very clear ideas. Okay, we wouldn't be here, none of us, if our grandparents had not vaccinated our parents and our parents had not vaccinated us. No question. Okay. So vaccines are one of the greatest conquests of science and of mankind. Punto. Okay, you got it? And please get your influenza vaccine every year, even if you think you're young, which you are, but you think you're not going to get it. Listen to me, I've worked with influenza many years, get your flu vaccine. But apart from that, um, the, the issue with, I think, um, vaccines and communication about vaccines is that um, stakeholders want certainties, okay? Science has no certainties. And I think I've showed you, look at Chris Froome, running through time, at one point, it seemed like we worked with humors. We, our knowledge changes, and so, Therefore, would I say, why don't you get a vaccine that was developed in the 50s? No, there are better vaccines now, and there will be better vaccines. However, vaccines are to be used and are, to, are, are the most important tool that have protected our health since they were discovered. And I may just want to add another little pill of wisdom because they say, ah, but they might have side effects. Eh? Might have side effects. Living has side effects. Eating has side effects. It depends. It depends. Maybe not for you, but for the people around you, it does have side effects. So, um, going back to your question about vaccines, I, and it's not only an Italian problem, it's an international problem. There's been more cases of measles in the, I think already in 2019, certainly in 2018, but I think already in 2019, the data that they have is because the vaccination levels have gone down. And we really can't afford to have people getting infected and dying of measles in 2020. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Okay. In some ways, your manifesto is a call to action. It's a call to action. To scientists, for sure, but also to each of us. Yes. To institutions, uh, universities, uh, uh, to um, companies. You have many stakeholders, which is the most difficult stakeholders to convince and to, go, to, to have on board. In your the politician. Opinion. Because the politician is chasing tomorrow. He's chasing the next elections. He's not chasing your health. And he's certainly, look, this I can assure you. Politicians are not concerned about the health of your children. So that is the most difficult stakeholder to engage. However, um, a, antimicrobial resistance is a very good example of this. Um, a few years ago, there was an, a call to action about a AMR, and uh, thanks, I have to say, to um, the UK government, um, there was a special committee that was chaired by um, Jim O'Neill, Thank you. Uh, Jim O'Neill uh, on AMR, and they did a wonderful job. Wonderful job because there now is a roadmap, and at least we know more or less where to go. And the politicians are on board. The, the British chief medical officer uh, is on board, and so it's moving. Um, so 
Politicians will not move in advance, but when they realize that they're not going to uh, escape it, then they will move. Unfortunately, we need to be prepared to tell them what they have to do, because if we, ha if we haven't been on the problem for long enough, we won't know what to do. And we don't, won't know what to tell them. Yeah, and probably each of us uh, has a, a his or her own responsibility in challenging yes. for, uh, this kind of issues. Okay, other questions? Uh, this, uh, hello, I'm Chiara. Uh, this one Sorry, helped. Which program are you attending? Uh, ESS. 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 Um, okay. This so one helped. Uh, revolution seems very fascinating. I wanted to ask how is it perceived in the US where there is, health is a very like, hot issue in general? Thank you. So actually, the One Health movement in the US is um, alive and kicking. However, the One Health movement in the US has concentrated on the emerging disease issue. And so mainly on, for example, there are enormous programs of uh, looking into wild animals to identify new pathogens or reservoirs of pathogens. Um, and so uh, that is where most of the concern is. Because, you know, here we are talking about big things and big, you know, Massimi uh, Sistemi, but there's an Ebola outbreak which is killing people. There, there are things that are happening. And uh, I have to say that most of the American effort has been geared around this and also now around antimicrobial resistance. But what I'm trying to do in this manifesto is really about, okay, emerging diseases was yesterday's story. Now we, have, we, are, we are aware that we have climate change, we have um, globalization, and we have numbers to measure. We are producing numbers all the time. All we need to do, and I can't do it for you, is put those numbers together and look at health where, and see where it should be, i.e. overlapping the areas of animal health, human health, and environmental health should overlap and converge. There is another question. Hello, my name is Andrea from Accounting, Financial Management and Control. My question was about, like, uh, as someone uh, said before, it's pretty easy to uh, get wrong information. Fake news are easier to spread out in respect to scientific reports. My, and you told about that everyone is aware of climate change, but actually there's still people that tweet that they want a little bit more climate change in New York City. Uh, my question is, if you see any possible way of spreading real news and scientific-based uh, 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 information instead of fake news and people that actually do not believe in One Health and climate change and all this stuff. Thank you. Well, yeah, of course, I mean, I, I don't have the solution to the problem of fake news, which actually um, hit me very hard, so I, I, I don't know. Um, however, you have to respect people that see things in another way, but you still have to be convinced of your own ideas. Um, in the United States, there is a movement of uh, terrabiattisti, no? Uh, they think the earth is flat. They do. Uh, yes. No, no, it's true. And there's, there's quite a lot of them, too. And so um, I think that science has to really um, criticize itself and um, improve on the communication level and uh, also invest on trusted sources of information because or else we're just going to get messed up and confused. I, I personally, I think that that is um, where we should be pointing, what we should be asking, what you guys should be demanding. And you guys should not be amplifiers of fake news. Remember, remember, because fake news can destroy people's lives. Thank you.
Another, Another question. question. <laughs> last one. Last one. Last one. She is. Sì, sì. C'era anche lei. Alla nostra international. Thank you. Um, so you're talking about like everything's connected and everything, but I just want to understand what's your perspective of about the technology of curing those diseases and everything. Like, are we going to be able to do it, or is just like understanding that we're all connected? You know. Well, no. We have to use levers that are in other compartments to co-advance the health of the system. So there are ways that you can intervene on, on mosquitoes and not kill the bees. Um, with reference to health issues and in, in emergic infections, there is science that is coming. The development of new antibiotics is not coming that fast because it's difficult. They're really difficult to find and they also have to have certain characteristics. So, um, will they be curable in the, pa in the future? I expect so. But we cannot continue fueling the system because we'll always be chasing the next variant. The very last one. Okay. Me? Si. Sí. Hey. So, so. I am Christian from the Economics and Social Sciences Master. So, um, going back to the GMO issues, like, I'm not a big fan of GMOs because, uh, to the best of my knowledge, there is no long-run study on the impact of GMOs. But the scary question is, what's the alternative to GMOs? Okay. 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 Right? There are no long-term studies on many things. Many, many, many things. Viagra? No. Viagra, they all... Vedi tutti sveglia adesso? You talk about bees, ah, yeah, yeah, that's their problem. Talk about Viagra. <laughs> okay, okay, Viagra, are there any long-term studies? They only invented it uh, 20 years ago, so it can't be a long-term study. Um, so, yeah, we don't have long-term studies. It's true. However, the science uh, is solid, and I would invite you to try and understand certain things and to... Um, Try and scratch beyond the surface and understand that between using a genetically modified tree and spraying trees with antibiotics, maybe we can go with genetically modified trees. So there's no right answer, there's no wrong answer. Genetically modified vaccines, <gasps> papilloma virus is a genetically modified vaccine. And we already know what it's, what it's doing and all the good it's doing. So, yeah. Genetically modified is the right word. It defines something, but it was perceived in a way that basically burnt it from the start. And so that's why there's all this. Um, that's the way it is. Si, sí, eso qua. Thank you. Hi, my name is Eva from uh, uh, GIO. To build on his question, do you think that uh, the Americans are more ready in terms of social weather to accept the GMOs and maybe be ready to consume products that have GMOs because it's like a lot more regulated in Europe than it is for us in North America? Yeah, that's, I mean, it's, it's true. So let me tell you this. So they have genetically modified salmons, salmoni. Um, so what they've done is they, there's two types of salmons, the Pacific salmon and the Atlantic salmon. The Pacific salmon grows much faster, the Pacific goes bigger ocean, and so they have um, developed a transgenic fish that it has the growth promoter of the Pacific salmon but the meat of the Atlantic salmon. And um, they are sterile and um, they, in the U.S., they, they have them not on U.S. land. So, you, so <laughs> we are growing fish on land because you can't put them in the water because if they get free, what happens? But not on U.S. land. <laughs> so they're, they're growing these fish in tanks 
uh, I think, uh, in Mexico, in Panama, and in Canada. But the American consumer, I think, is, is ready. Because I think you can, you can get it. Um, you can't farm it, but you can buy it. Um, the American consumer, from what I see, and this is Ilaria speaking, not the science, I don't know enough about consumer trends, but it's going to be a matter of time because they're so much cheaper. And, uh, Ah, and genetically modified mosquitoes, which are to control disease, they have sterile males that therefore, because it's a female, do you know what I'm talking about? To control vector-borne diseases, you can, you can make a, 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 a mosquito male that doesn't have Viagra, no, this is, um, that is not able to uh, f produce a viable progeny. And so, when the baby mosquitoes, they hatch from the eggs, they're not viable. And, and that is, they are already being used in, in some parts of the world, and they are effective measures. Because then some of these have suicide genes, so you, they just... Anyway, it's a bit too complicated, but... Mm. Uh, my name is Daniel, I study data science. Uh, I would like to ask a question regarding the concept of One Health. Mm. Well, the environment is always changing, it's very volatile, species come and go. And we are looking for a human concept of help that's basically stable. Mm. We want people to live a very stable life, uh, also for animals. Uh, in the example you gave about oranges in uh, Florida, uh, we think that oranges are uh, sort of a good species. We think they are sweet, they are marketable, and we decided to try to protect, uh, protect them. Uh, um, in this case, uh, was it good for the environment? Uh, wasn't the best option, the most health option for people, for also for the environment, just to let the orange tree die, and then the next species would eventually go there? Yeah, if you're going to live 3,000 years, yes. We can wait for oranges to, be, to become extinct, and then for a new variety to emerge. However, um, Okay, so this is like, there's a subtle thing that I think most of you have missed, which is, if you intervene immediately, you don't need genetically modified trees. And that's the problem that happened in Puglia. So, those olive trees needed to be treated and eradicated immediately. This has not been done and the infection is progressing. And the same has been in Florida with oranges. They got infected, they didn't diagnose it immediately, they thought they were going to fix it, and then it became explosive. But let me tell you something else. That one of the biggest problems that there are now with reference to tree diseases is that roguing trees, so cutting trees, is expensive. And so they leave the dead trees or the sick trees, they abandon the orchard, and that becomes an of a source of more infection and more infection. So I'm not saying that genetically modified trees is a solution of the future. I am saying that in certain instances, we have put ourselves in such a mess that the only way that will preserve the industry and the economic turnover of that industry, or one of the ways, is to use genetically modified trees. If we hadn't introduced the disease, or if we had some, had we had good plant pathologists that were able to identify it immediately, if you um, kill, cut the trees, it's okay. So, but it's a very complex issue. I agree with you, and and. Um, here we study economics, and I don't think that an 11, 11 billion industry, like the citrus industry in, Flo in Florida, is going to say, okay, we'll wait for the next citrus variant to emerge. But there's a little bit of this going on. They're planting other types that are less susceptible, so there's ways of doing it, but not of fixing a disaster, which is what this is just now. I think that uh, there are many connections between uh, our disciplines, uh, economics, uh, social sciences, uh, and uh, biology and uh, medicine. And uh, I would like to thank you very much for your speech because uh, you, help, help, you have helped us to have 
a critical view about uh, our, uh, not only discipline, but our, our lives. Thank you really much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. E povero. Studiate per due cose. Thank you.